All right, everybody. Uh, hi. I want to welcome you to Scale Kickstarter Backer Update number five. <laughs> Giant flower. Uh, take a look at that awesome lighthouse. Okay, we'll deal with that in a minute. So I thought everyone was probably getting tired of the uh, administrative house, so I made a giant administrative rock. So if we just scale that bad boy down, pick it up and get out of the way. Oh, what do we have here? It's some names. What are these names? These names are the amazing people who are making prints for us. I'm really excited about this. Uh, Aaron Diaz, who's the creator of Dresden Kodak, is making a scale print. I can't wait to see what he does with it. Uh, Dresden Kodak is gorgeous. It's a, it's a comic if you have no idea what's going on. Uh, go check it out right now. And he ran an amazingly successful Kickstarter to make a new and different comic apart from Dresden Kodak. I guess it was more of a graphic novel. Okay, uh, Casey Green of Gun Show, um, which is really funny and interesting, and he's also the creator of many fine, I don't know how to describe them, <laughs> uh, dig butt. Uh, David Hellman, creator of The Art for Braid, the excellent second quest, which is in progress and was kickstarted, and of course, the incomparable A Lesson is Learned, but the damage is irreversible, which is my favorite webcomic of all time. And our own Dale Baran, uh, who has writing scale, of course, uh, and did the writing for A Lesson is Learned, but also does his own comic, does the art and the writing, uh, The Nerds of Paradise, as well as various other things. Okay, um, let's see. So we promised a big, up, uh, a big announcement. Um, around here somewhere no uh, let's see oh yeah um, there we go <laughs> yes it's steam we got on steam I'm really excited about that whoa I maybe people were expecting a different platform but that's a big deal for us to get on steam and to be able to release the game on steam it's one of my favorite ways to digest game content, and I really like having all my stuff in one place, so I like Steam a lot. Um, all right, so now that that big announcement is out of the way, go away. Um, let's take a look at this lighthouse, this amazingly gorgeous lighthouse made by Andrew Cogshaw, and in fact made uh, three days ago, just like this whole level was. Um, <laughs> And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so we got this this lighthouse, and um, it's got windows in it. But if I like try to jump in that window, like that's too small for me. And I can see that up there where the lamp would be, there's a sweet particle, and I totally want to get that. But it's clearly sealed in here, and I could like jump on top of this thing and try to scale it up, and like like drop down and get in one of the windows but they're like totally flush with the side of the thing so I don't know if that's such a good strategy um, so oh yeah um, my name is Steve Swink this is a picture of me uh, perhaps I'm gonna say the last selfie I'm ever gonna take it's the first and the last but anyway I'm modeling one of the uh, blue scale shirts so fancy and they're they're like made out of amazing material and everyone loves them okay bye um, yeah okay so that is this that is that we can't get into this oh what's that it's the moon that's interesting I wonder if we can oh yes oh yes we did it we did it like today <laughs> um, we did it just for you thank you thank you thank you thank you once again to all our amazing backers I revealed that by making the sea go down by scaling down the moon and I just wanted to once again th thank everyone who's been a backer of our Kickstarter and a supporter and who spread the word and we're at 60% now actually more I'm, I'm pretty sure um, and I'm really happy about that because we are way less than halfway done with the Kickstarter so we're on track we're kicking butt it's looking good and I just wanted to say thank you again Okay, sorry about that. I had to adjust the position of the boat relative to the lighthouse. Okay, so wandering around here, focusing on this stuff, noticing that, wondering if it could be scaled, seeing that it can, scaling it up. And look at that. And it has like nice buoyancy physics on the boat and everything like that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about puzzles. There's a guy by the name of Scott Kim. I uh, used to give these great talks at the Game Developers Conference, and um, 
called himself the Puzzle Master, and he had a definition for puzzles that I like, but I'd like to extrapolate into some interesting directions. His definition of a puzzle was that it was fun and that it had a right answer. And I think that's interesting as far as it goes, but I have a problem with definitions generally just because I think that game design is so multifarious, complex, difficult to understand. I think that um, it's sort of wrong-headed to try and make a definition of it. So I think that actually what I'm calling a cluster concept is much more usable for game design discussions. We have a lot of discussions about game design in my sort of circle of super successful indie friends uh, who are amazing and awesome and who I love. And we talk, we try to de define things because definition is sort of useful, but I think it's not, so to speak, useful relative to what we're trying to discuss. So essentially a cluster concept is a bunch of ideas, topics, examples, concepts that gather around a particular heading and they don't necessarily have more or less weight, they just sort of gather around and it, it has the benefit of not being linear because definitions are by definition linear, whereas game design is sort of abstract and uh, messy and has lots of different moving parts that you have to keep in your head at one time, whether you're a designer or a player, but particularly if you're trying to create something. And so I think it just makes a lot more sense to kind of cluster these things together and not try to say game design is blah, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so anyway. Do, 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 do. So let's talk a little bit about puzzles. So Scott Kim had that definition, and I like it a lot. Um, this is a cluster concept that gets a lot closer to my understanding of a puzzle. And, you know, I consider a game like Braid or The Swapper and things like that to have puzzles. I don't think Portal has puzzles quite as much as these other games, and I'll talk about why that is in just a minute. Um, but first, let me give you this. Okay, so try to solve the puzzle here. These are rebuses. You know, take your time. I, I'll be here when you get back. Just, you know, pause the video. Go try to solve these. Na, na, na. Na, na, na. Okay, enough of that silliness. Never a wrong time for the Jurassic Park theme, I feel. Okay, so... Did you solve them? I'm gonna put the answers at the end of the video so that you don't see them without trying to solve them, you cheater, cheater, make cheater pants. Okay, so these puzzles are interesting to me. Um, one, because they're invitingly simple. They're just a series of symbols, uh, pictures, um, you know, an A, it's part of the alphabet, it's the first letter, plus a door, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the solution is a little surprising and you have to make a certain perceptual shift in order to see it. You have to sort of unanchor your perception and keep shifting through different ways of thinking. And for me, the, the particular perceptual shift that I have to undergo is I have to notice that that sheep has a bow on its head, so there's a clue for you. Okay, so assuming that you have solved that puzzle mentally by now, but probably haven't solved the one at the bottom, um, let's talk about challenge and difficulty in puzzles. Do, 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 do as we get closer and closer to this window. Better make it a little bit bigger, shall we? Gotta be able to fit through there. Okay, so, there was a guy by the name of Mihaly Chisek Mihaly. Uh, I, I understand that everyone just calls him Mike. And he had this idea of flow. And um, I don't think this is like a catch-all, this is all you need to understand about game design kind of thing, but it is an interesting concept. And he wrote a book on it, which I highly recommend. It's called Beyond Boredom and Anxiety. Uh, it came out in the 70s, I believe. And it's still totally readable today, uh, even if you're not a trained scientist or statistician or social theorist or whatever. Uh, really great, highly recommend it. Anyway, he had this idea of flow. And he wanted to explain why people would go rock climbing or why they would jump out of planes. Because the traditional psychological explanations for those things, which was you would, you would do it for fame or fortune, that would be the, high, the, the only motivators for people, uh, just didn't seem to fit because why would you undergo these you know, death possible uh, situations uh, if they weren't going to get any monetary reward or any fame out of it. So what he came up with was this idea of flow and he mapped challenge and ability on two axes and he called flow the flow channel in the middle, the state that you get into, the zoned out state, like if you're playing uh, Quake or Unreal Tournament or Counter-Strike or 
not first person shooters, I don't know, Starcraft 2 or something, um, and you just totally zone out and you're just killing it and you're not thinking, what am I doing, what's going on, you don't have an embodied personhood, you're not yourself, you're just, just flowing, everything's just flowing in the game and you're just totally killing it, right? Um, so he would say that you're in the flow channel and basically if the challenge that you're facing is mapped perfectly to your ability or within a certain range then you're going to be in the flow state and you're kind of in that euphoric zoned out state like almost sometimes you get into it when you're driving long distances on the highway um, if your challenge if the amount of challenge that's presented in the situation is much greater than your ability you're going to be with what he calls anxiety what i would call frustration in the in game terms or you get mad salty you're going to flip the arcade cabinet and run out the door um, but if if your ch if the challenge presented is like way less than your ability, then you're going to be bored. And in both cases, you'll probably stop the activity just because it's really boring. Okay, so um, what is interesting about that to our current discussion is this diagram that Scott Kim made, part, pardon the uh, puzzle on top of that. Um, but basically the problem with trying to make and maintain flow in a game about puzzles is that once a puzzle is solved, it's solved and it's no longer interesting. So it sort of has this staccato up and down hard line thing where you have to create a progression of puzzles across a game that um, challenge the player just enough but don't doesn't frustrate them or bore them. Right? And that's really hard to do because different players have different ability levels and they bring what I would call a different perceptual field to the, to the bearing of the puzzle, right? It's the sum total of all their experiences and ideas and all everything that's happened in their life they bring all that knowledge to the sort of to the puzzle which is interesting and you know if you didn't speak english um if you spoke swahili or something or if you're an aboriginal you know person from the the from australia or something then probably the, you're not equipped to solve these puzzles but then of course me growing up in san jose california i wouldn't be equipped to sort out you know 27 different types of rocks or something you know some task that they'd be really good at right um so that's my perceptual field right and so solving that puzzle is really you know i'm set up to do it and and but as a designer of puzzles you have to think about that right which is which is makes it really difficult so with scale i kind of want to go on a different axis here right i don't want to be between frustration and boredom I just want to be interesting. So, you know, you have to undergo this perceptual shift to notice the bow on the top of the U's head and, um, you know, sort of see laterally. I'm mostly interested in that. I want to get off the axis of difficulty and get on board with interesting, fun, different, weird, you know, discovery, secrets, finding things. And necessarily, I think people will call it a puzzle game just because of the way that it's formatted and they don't have a word for it. But I'm much more interested in sort of understanding or, or uncovering hidden truths. All right, so by this point, you're probably thinking, uh, hey, I'd really like him to jump inside that lighthouse and show us what's going on in there. And um, yeah, so you're kind of wondering what the hidden truth is inside here. So burp, here we go. Oh, look what we have here. It's an amazing piece of artwork by Aaron Diaz of Dresden Kodak, who's making a sweet scale print. He does the most lovely illustrations, and I can't wait to see what his take on Penny and the world of scale is. Uh, Mr. Hellman, the inimitable David Hellman. Uh, this is a really gorgeous overworld map that he drew, and I love his use of color. I know that's kind of his trademark, but man, does he ever have an eye for color. Uh, this is Casey Green's hug box, which appears to be a Tetris piece headed deer. I think that's really awesome. And of course our own Dale Baran who did this lovely illustration for scale, Kickstarter, head page, whatever you want to call it. Alright, so let's hop on up, hop on up to the, yeah, alright, here we go. Uh, so anyway, I think you, unless, you know, without having me show this to you, you probably have to undergo a little bit of a perceptual shift to see that there was a moon up there to think maybe I could scale it and then scale it and then sort of get that enjoyable hit of seeing the water level go up and down and so it, I think of that as not a particularly challenging puzzle quote unquote it's just sort of an interesting discovery that I put in the world for you to find um, yeah and that's kind of what scale is all about so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up here 
I want to say thank you again to all our backers. You guys are super awesome. We're over 60% now, and we're way less than halfway through the Kickstarter, so that is fantastic. Uh, you know, keep getting the word out. You know, pledge if you want to. Uh, <laughs> um, remember, the prints come at the 60 plus level, I believe. 60, 64. Max will be mad at me if I get it wrong. Anyway, it's one of those two, and um, and above. And yeah, I think that's all for us. So follow me on Kickstarter at Steve Swink. Uh, join our Facebook page. I'll put a link at the end. I'll put links to all that other cool stuff at the end. Scott Kim, The Rebus, uh, Indie Game Enthusiast, and all the amazing artists who are making prints for us. And uh, yeah, thanks so much.